another place 10 days ago. Um, this is the 50th anniversary of the Berkeley Statistics Department. And I didn't, because of the circumstances, give the talk I'd originally planned uh, 10 days ago, and then uh, was very happy to be invited by the students, late, Twitter, to uh, talk to some students, and somehow it seems to have expanded a little bit. <laughs> uh, it's very nice that there is an interest in the history of the department. It's a remarkable department, and I think it has a remarkable history. And I'm happy to have a little bit about it. <coughs> So the department was born, so to speak, in 1950, but as you know, birth is usually preceded by pregnancy, a period of gestation, and in the case of the department, this period lasted rather long, 17 years. That's much longer even than elephants who only take two years. <laughs> uh, and if I may just use this rather corny analogy for one more moment. Uh, the partner also, this baby, had two parents. They were, on the one hand, Chris uh, Evans, on the other hand, Jersey Neyman. Um, we're very much in, here locally in uh, the presence of these two people, because this is Evans Hall, named after Griffith Evans, and this room is the naming room, named after me, so uh, so what I'm going to do now is to tell you how this uh, conception came about. And I have to go back rather far to the early 1930s, the mathematics department at the University of California, Berkeley, was in very sad shape. None of the faculty was doing any research. The teaching was extremely out of date and old fashioned. New developments in mathematics were not being presented. And the situation got so bad that the science departments, particularly the physicists, complained to the administration and said they had to do something about it. Uh, a better mathematics department was needed. So the administration appointed a committee that looked around uh, to find somebody who could rejuvenate the department. And the choice eventually fell on Griffith C. Evans, who at the time was teaching at Rice University. He was one of the most distinguished American mathematicians. He'd just been elected to the National Academy. And after considerable negotiations, at first he turned down the offer, but then eventually he accepted, and he arrived here in 1934. And one thing that was very remarkable and very unusual uh, about him is that he had an extraordinarily broad view of mathematics. He didn't think of it just as pure mathematics or even pure and applied mathematics, but he thought of the department he wanted to build of mathematical sciences, which would include statistics and logic and actuarial science. And if computer science had existed at the time, he would have wanted to include that too, but it, it didn't exist then. And um, statistics had a high priority for him. He looked around for a long time, uh, asked various people, tried out various names, and eventually, after a long search, he decided the person he really wanted was Jersey Neyman. Uh, he'd never met the guy, but he'd sent out one of his students to observe him, and he'd gotten back a good report. And uh, he, he felt fairly comfortable about it. So in 1937, having never met him, he offered him a full professorship with tenure, of course. Uh, and so that's one side of the story. Now let's turn 
to the other side, the main side. Oh, before I do that, let me just show you a picture with which you really probably are all familiar with. Um, up ends. It didn't come out terribly well, but probably most of you have seen it because it's hanging downstairs uh, in the Marcel Library over the entranceway. Um, it's a painting by Earl Loran, which was uh, done especially for the opening of Evans Hall. So, how did this situation look? from Nim's point of view. Nim was a Polish statistician who was at that time uh, in the uh, early in the mid thirties living in London. He was in the department of his uh, collaborator Egon Pearson, the son of Carl Pearson. And in 1937, he got totally out of the blue a letter from a guy he'd never heard of, Evans, who was at the university he'd never heard of, the University of California, <laughs> which was at a place he'd never heard of, Berkeley. So, he had three choices at that point. He could go back to Poland. The trouble there was that there was not clear that there was a job for him, uh, although probably he could have cobbled something together as he had, as he had before he went to England. Or he could stay in London, in Ewan Pearson's department. He had tenure here that was equivalent to an associate professorship. But it was also pretty clear that there were not much of a prospect of promotion because the <coughs> English system had one professor, one chair, and that was Pearson, and he would be under him and remain sort of uh, in, in, in that place. Or he might take the risk, come to this completely unknown place in the wilderness. Uh, who knows what it would be like. And it was particularly risky also because he had a wife and a very young son, so he didn't come just alone. He first suggested to Evans, why don't I come for a one-year visit? And we'll sniff each other out and see how it works. But uh, surprisingly, Evans did not accept that suggestion. Seems to me it was not an unreasonable suggestion. But, but Evans said, look, we are willing to take a risk with you, so we expect you to take a risk with us and take it or leave it. So eventually, uh, Evans suggested, all right, I'll go to California, and he arrived in August 1938. At that time, he was not a terribly well-known figure. Um, the kind of statistics he'd done, the most important papers had been in 33 and 34 and 37, so just a very, very few years earlier. Uh, today, I think most people who are interested in think about these things consider him, together with Fisher, as the architects of classical statistics. And let me, I know you've all seen pictures of men probably in the department. Here's a nice picture of him. This is about the way he looked at the time he came. Mm -hmm. So, men came here. His appointment was as professor of mathematics. He immediately set up a very small core uh, program of courses, one lower division, one year upper division, and one year graduate course. They all had laboratories. He did all the lecturing and had graduate students with the labs. This was all within the <coughs> mathematics department. But he also set up a separate organization, it's also in the mathematics department at that time, its budget was part of the math department budget, 
which he called Statistical Laboratory, and of which the university appointed him as director, that gave him uh, uh, secretarial help, half-time secretary, um, some offices. He needed space because um, of the laboratories and the uh, uh, calculators that were, that were needed for them. Incidentally, the statistics of the laboratory was never in the same place as the math department because of these special spatial requirements, um, which gave Lane a certain amount of independence and freedom, not being directly uh, in, the, in the department. <coughs> um, he did practically all the teaching by himself. He, I'm sure, at the time already had uh, visions of expanding this into a bigger program, but not so very long after he got here, uh, the Second World War came to the United States, and all his energy and that of the various people he surrounded himself with, graduate students and uh, lecturers and so on, all temporary people, uh, everybody was working like crazy on war-related work uh, connected with bombing acts. He had a big contract for that. And so during these war years, 1941 to 1945, uh, there was really no development on the academic side at all. So um, the development really didn't start until 1945, <coughs> after the war was over. So it took really not the 17 years that I mentioned at the beginning, but only 10 years, if you count it that way, from converting this one person laboratory into the 11 department, uh, 11 person department that it became in 1955. And the first uh, regular faculty appointment uh, then made is in 1946. And it was one of his own graduate students that he gave an instructorship to at that point, who then uh, became a, a, a tender fa faculty member. And that person was me. <laughs> <laughs> so let me just say one or two words about um, uh, my situation. I had arrived in January 1941 from Europe to Berkeley to study mathematics. And as nearly all the statisticians of my generation was pushed into statistics because of the war. What happened is that Evans one day called me in and said, um, you'd be a lot more useful if you did some applied work. And two possibilities are physics or statistics. Now, I had had substantial experience, very negative experience with physics. <laughs> in no circumstances did I want to go into that. On the other hand, statistics, you can't imagine what the situation in 1941-42 uh, was like as far as statistics. It was an unknown subject. I'd never heard of it. And the faintest notion of what it was, but I knew it couldn't be as bad as physics. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, I need to get it right. Um, so I got my PhD in 1946, a student of name, and then uh, through rather uh, unusual circumstances, I got a faculty appointment. What happened is that Nehmen was going to be in leave the fall semester of 1946 uh, in Columbia with Wald, and he thought this was a good moment to make uh, a certain appointment in addition to him, and he was looking for a senior appointment. Um, Polia was one of the persons he really would have liked to have. But it was already summer of 46, and this was going to be for the fall of 46, and everybody was already committed. So he couldn't get anybody. So he fell back on that only uh, alternative that he saw and took his own student who had just gotten his PhD and gave him an instructorship. And that meant that this first semester was very strange for me because, first of all, 
I was, te- I was going to teach Naaman's graduate course, the course that's now through 10. Uh, I'd just gotten my PhD. Secondly, being the only regular faculty member, I was made acting director of the laboratory. <laughs> Not that that meant very much, because I was just bombarded with letters by name from Columbia practically any day, every day. At least three pages of instructions. See this person and talk to him about that, and see if he did that. This person's making good progress with that thesis, and so on and so on and so on. So it was not a very independent position that I had there. <laughs> anyway, that was it. And from then on, 1946 to 55, nine years, we made nine appointments, all by name, uh, made by name personally, and uh, we made them roughly one year, not completely. And what I'm going to do now is to tell you who these nine people were, and then just say two or three sentences about each. <coughs> So 46 was my appointment, 47 with Edward Brankin. I, I might say that of these nine people, probably some of them are names that are familiar to you and some of them you may not have heard of. Edward Brankin, he was actually, he was a Berkeley PhD in 1947, but he obtained his degree not in statistics, but in algebra, in pure mathematics. But he had taken a lot of statistics courses and then appointed him. We worked on rather mathematical things, sufficient statistics, uh, exponential families, and later on he uh, got very involved with some rather esoteric theory of stochastic processes and behavior. And uh, he died fairly young, at age 65. He'd all his life been an extremely heavy smoker, and he died of lung cancer. And this is next year, 1948, so two Berkeley graduate students so far. It was the first outside appointment. That was of Michel, Michel Loev, uh, the Frenchman, student of the great problemist Paul Lévy. Uh, and his assignment was to build a probability program uh, in, in Berkeley. And, um, as you know, we have an absolutely outstanding probability program today that goes back to the seeds of Loeb. So it was a great success. And his name may be familiar to a lot of you because there is the Loeb Prize, which is given every two years, and which was just given a few weeks ago here. Then the next year, was the appointment of Joe Hodges. He was a student of Neyman's, very, very original man. Uh, one of his great achievements was uh, the discover, discovery of super efficiency. Um, Fisher had claimed that maximum likelihood estimators are efficient. And people tried very, very hard, and top people like Dube and Hotelling had uh, made efforts in this direction to prove that, and nobody had been successful. And Joe Hodges produced an extremely simple example. In the most regular situation you could imagine, a sample from a normal distribution and I know me showing the reason that people hadn't been able to prove the theorem was because it was wrong. <laughs> um, so, um, he was a very close friend of mine. We collaborated on many papers. We wrote 16 papers together, many, but not all of them, in the non parametric field. We also wrote a joint book, Basic Concepts of Probability and Statistics, which uh, was originally published in 64. We went out of print in 90, 1990 when the publishing company went bankrupt and has just very recently, few weeks ago, uh, been reissued in the Siam Classic series. Later, Joe became a high-level administrator. Uh, he was a personnel advisor, first to the Berkeley Chancellor, and then the president of the university, and he pretty much opted out of statistical research. 
So that was 49. And the next year is wrong. It should have been 1950. <laughs> In 1950, uh, men appointed two people, both of them women. One was Evelyn Fix. She had come quite early when Nen first started his wartime research to head up the staff of the, particularly the, uh, all of the, she was in charge of all the computation. And those were not computers as we know them today, these were calculators, Friedmans and Marchands and things like that. Um, and she got her PhD in 1950. Uh, she worked primarily in applications to health, and again, some of you who attend the graduation exercises may have heard her name because there's also a fixed prize for the student with outstanding work in health sciences. Perhaps our most outstanding paper is a joint paper with Joe Hodges, and the first paper on non-parametric density estimation, which was uh, dealt with the subject very thoroughly and written very well. But they didn't publish it. It was a technical report. And then uh, in 1989, uh, <laughs> nearly 40 years later, um, uh, Bernard Selman, who uh, was uh, himself had written a book on density estimation, um, felt that the paper was so important that it deserved publication even that late. And so it was published in 1989 in the ISI review, written by Selwyn. The other woman who was appointed that same year was Elizabeth Scott. She had obtained her degree in astronomy, although in statistical uh, astronomy. Um, she worked extensively with in applications of statistics to astronomy, but also in other subjects. And they also had a paper which was very uh, interesting and very surprising. They gave the first example of a maximum likelihood estimator, which was not only inefficient, but was not even consistent. She was the chair of the department in 1969 to 73 when we moved from Campbell Hall to Evans Hall, and so she was instrumental in designing the layout of the department, the uh, coffee room and the uh, reprint room and the office and so on, and uh, you may either uh, think very highly of her for that reason, or you may not think so highly of her for that reason, depending on how you like the layout. <laughs> Eric? Let yeah. ask a question. Is it true that uh, she's responsible for them being a, there being a women's bathroom on every floor? That is very possible. Right. I, I can't swear to it, but I think that would be a lot. <laughs> she was also responsible for all the computers, starting the computers. Uh -huh. That was the point when uh, it was a big thing. All right, since we had two appointments in 50, there was none in 51, but there was one in 52. That was Lucien Lacan, another Frenchman, another uh, student of Neyman's, who is uh, renowned for his asymptotic theory, where he uh, coined many new concepts, including the concept of continuity. Um, he was very strongly influenced by the Bourbaki School of Mathematics, and as a result, his work was very general and very abstract. Um, he, he wrote a book, Asymptotic Method and Statistical Decision Theory, which is the word on the subject, but it's so hard that uh, he decided, together with his student, uh, Grace Yang, to write what I call the calm light, this uh, easier version of the book uh, in 1990. He also had a graduate course, a year course, in asymptotic theory. And that, th that course was notorious for its difficulty. In fact, it was so difficult, considered by the students so difficult, that many of them 
Most of them ordered it at least once, and some of them ordered it twice before they dared take it for credit. <laughs> <laughs> in the same year, also, uh, when brought Henry Chaffee to Berkeley, uh, he was supposed to be particularly concerned with the applied side of the statistics. Um, one of the things he's famous for is the simultaneous inference procedure, which is now sometimes called the S method, conference, simultaneous conference uh, intervals for all uh, contrasts. And also, he wrote a book uh, in 1959 on the analysis of variance, which for many years was the standard book. It had particularly a 40 page chapter in which he uh, discussed in some detail very seriously the, what happened if the assumptions under which all these methods had been derived were not satisfied. And that was the first really rigorous and you know, good treatment of, of this very important subject. He and I uh, collaborated in a number of papers, and uh, one of the results is the concept of completeness of sufficient statistic. Uh, which we named. Well, we're nearing the end of this list. In 1955, uh, another point was made of somebody who was sitting here, <laughs> David Blackwell. Uh, he has brought a very broad interest in uh, many important contributions, not only to traditional probability theory and mathematical statistics, but also to very new subjects with which the department is not familiar, uh, sequential analysis and game theory. He also had the distinguished uh, distinction of being the only Bayesian in the department. And I asked him the other day whether Lehman knew that he was a Bayesian, but Lehman <laughs> was violently anti-Bayesian uh, when he hired him, but David wasn't quite sure, but he, he said they had had some conversations about it, but I don't think it was true just when those took place. Uh, he was the first department chair after Lehman to resign the chairmanship of the department a year after it had been formed in 1956. Finally, uh, with Aaron Tumajan, who uh, was a student of Dallas Blackwell, had been here earlier, and so had a student. Uh, he was particularly interested in information theory. Uh, his appointment was split uh, after a year between statistics and electrical engineering. So that's, that's the 11 people who constituted the department uh, when it was born in 1955. It was a really wonderful and great group. It was quite closely knit. There was much joint work. There was joint work between Fix and Hodges, which I mentioned, Fix and Neyman, Neyman and Scott. Uh, I had collaborated with both Hodges and Chaffee. David, I think you wrote a joint paper with Joe once, or with Lucia, and with Lucia also. So uh, the atmosphere was very congenial for, for that purpose. Now, I should say that the account that I've given is very incomplete in some ways. There were quite a number of other appointments which, for one reason or other, didn't stick. Some were appointments where the person didn't get tenure. Um, the most important was Charles Stein, who was appointed as assistant professor in 1947, but left in 1949 for political reasons. That was the connection to the oath controversy. Um, I also omitted quite a number of other aspects. Of course, with the expansion of the faculty, obviously went an expansion of the course program. All kinds of new courses were installed, and uh, we could talk about those. Another growth problem that was quite serious for the name during those nine years, ten years, was the space issue. Um, as the group grew, as we got more students, more courses, more uh, 
graduate assistants and so on, we needed more space. And practically every year or two, we had to move from one building to another, once we went to Grinnell, once we went to Plumtree building, and uh, it took quite a while before we finally settled down first in Campbell, or uh, then in, uh, in Evans. And finally, I should mention that uh, one very important aspect of the development of the department where the symposia that Naaman organized at five-year intervals starting in 1945 and 1950 and 1955 and so on until 1970, which were the international meetings and statistics at the time. And COVID. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Well, finally, the department is now usually ranked either number one or two, uh, with Stanford holding the other position. The output of the department over the years, and I'm not stopping at 1955, but coming today, is just enormous. Uh, the department has graduated about 500 PhD students who are distributed all over the world many in academic situations, but also many in pharmaceutical uh, companies, in government, and so on. Um, many enormous amount of research has come out of the department, many leading texts, well, some that come to mind, major is film and design and purpose, which is uh, everybody here is familiar with, I'm sure, and Bickle and Dachson, which also is uh, uh, the standard text, and Pittman's book, The Probability Theory. And then when you look back on it, it's interesting to remember that it all started with one person, named, who came in 1938, and who built this empire that we now share. Anybody wants to hear more about some particular aspect?